What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to Call Game, Kenny for real, whatever you want to call it. But we just sit here and we talk about hoops. Late night episodes, man. Thank you to everybody that's watching. Turns out that about 70%, th think about this, 70% of the people that watch these videos regularly aren't even subscribed. So make sure you are subscribed, leave a like on the video, and let's get right into it. Today, I'm going to have to admit, a, a lot of my, my faults as an NBA fan were on display today because my, my biggest thing is that y'all know I am a Chicago Bulls fan first. So whenever the Bulls are playing, they have 90% of my attention. And today is one of those days where they decided to start five games at the same time. So the Bulls starting off... They got my eye. And then the other four games were on the other monitor, and I'm looking over, checking scores, trying to watch as much as I can. All that being said, I didn't watch every single possession of every single game. I don't know why you would even expect me to even be like that. The Bulls got a bulk of my attention, and, and the Bulls are in the win column, y'all. We did it. We're not the worst team in basketball. We'll see. We'll see. We'll we'll see. Um. So the last game of the day just wrapped up, and people were saying on Twitter that this is a bad day for basketball. A lot of blowouts. I I think, you know, I think I took away a lot of different things from today's slate of games, and the one I want to focus on up top in the top of the show is with the Toronto Raptors. Man, I don't know what the title of this video specifically says, but it has something to do with the Toronto Raptors are scaring me because through the first couple of games of the season they look bad. And not like, oh, we'll put it together, we're just missing shots bad, but like functionally they don't look good anymore. And part of me is trying to figure out, like, I watched this game, um, like I mentioned, the Bulls were starting before. So I re went back to rewatch portions of this game, and I was trying to put together why this team doesn't look good. First of all, they were going against Joel Embiid, and we know that they lost their two best defensive players or defensive bigs and, and Marcus Saul and Serge Ibaka. They're no longer here, so of course Joel Embiid was going to eat. But it was more like, the players that are on their team, Pascal Siakam does not look good. Um, he doesn't look pre-bubble Pascal Siakam, pre-all-star break of the 2019 season Pascal Siakam. And then the first couple games of the season, they pay Fred Van Vliet, obviously. And, well, they're trying to give him a role that wasn't really his role the per first couple years of him being the good Fred Van Vliet we know. So the the idea behind paying Fred Van Vliet is like, okay, Cal Lowry's, what, 34 years old at this point. Eventually, he's going to be, you know, teetering at that point where he's no longer starter quality player. It's just a, age is something that hits everybody and people age out of the league. So we're going to pay Fred Van Vliet, and we're going to slowly work him into this role where he's going to be our next Cal Lowry. And the problem with that is... They aren't the same player. The reason why they look so good when they're playing together is because Fred Van Vliet, at the end of the day, is more of an off-ball player than a, a pro ball handler. He's he's not a playmaker like Kyle Lowry is. So when we have those minutes where Kyle Lowry's on the bench and it's Fred Van Vliet trying to control the offense, it doesn't look good. And, and what surprises me is that, like, I, I, I watched a lot of their preseason games because they have Flint. They have Malachi Flint, and this is going to be a crazy reason, but Malachi Flint is a dog in 2K. So I, I don't watch college ball, so my first introduction to these guys is first the NBA draft and usually when it comes to summer league, but we didn't have any summer league, so I was watching preseason, and Malachi Flint looked like a guy that you can say, hey, um, he's good enough to be a backup point guard at this point. At least that's what it looked like in the preseason to me. But instead, they're trying to build Fred Van Vliet, which makes sense, but it just doesn't really work out. And not to mention that when Cal Lowry's not on the floor, there's the other four players and this new guard, whoever is going to be, none of them have ball hand in the ability. Pascal Siakam, as good as he can be, we know he has only a right hand. Ozzy Ananobi, as good as he is, and that's catch a shoot, and he had a beautiful game today, he can't put the ball on the floor like you would want some of your other players. So it's really like Cal Lowry as our ball handler, as our playmaker, and nothing else. And that's one of the reasons why they are struggling. And, and I talked about this on our podcast is that they didn't do a great job in replacing the bigs they lost. Like, the first couple of games of the season, Chris Boucher looked like he might be that guy. Then today, he went against a, a real, like, center center and Joel Embiid, one of the best in this class. And, well, he struggled. And Alex Lynn struggled. And, and Aaron Baines struggled. So, that's, that's my takeaway from the Toronto Raptors. I don't know what the remedy is. There was a portion in this game where there was, like, maybe four to five minutes where the Toronto Raptors did not score a bucket. And typically what we see from coaches when their team goes maybe two to three minutes without scoring, there's usually a timeout. But Nick Nurse is like, no, I'm going to let my guys ride with this not being able to score thing for five minutes. And that's not normal Nick Nurse things. Is it like I was giving Nick Nurse a lot of praise? Don't tell me we have to take all that success away from you, Nick. Come on, bro. 
So I'm not saying this is going to last for the 72-game season, but they need to figure it out, man. They need to figure it out because as of right now, all of those teams that we saw as far as like bona fide playoff teams, they're the one that looks the worst out of the bunch, which is which is saying a lot because I just always see that organization as consistency, 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 and they have not been that through the first three games of the season. Um, on the other side of things, luckily Joel Embiid is there because without Joel Embiid, the 76ers are not good. Tobias Harris had his best game of the season, which is good. Um, there's portions of the game where you want him to take a shot and say you put the ball on the floor but I'm not gonna complain with the production that they got from Tobias Harris if they got a Tobias Harris game like this more regularly then we might be having a conversation on how good the Philadelphia 76ers can really be I don't want to have the whole Ben Simmons conversation four games to the season they are three and one so we're gonna leave it at that congratulations to the Philadelphia 76ers but what I can say is that Ben Simmons is making it look like a James Harden trade might end up being inevitable. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it at that. Move on to the next game, which is the Warriors getting their second win, two game win streak. Y'all remember people on Twitter was saying that Steph Curry wasn't good anymore. Well, he went against two bad teams and he's getting his mojo back, and it's good. Kelly Oubre finally hit a jump shot. Wiggins, what he put up like 19 points in the fourth quarter. Those are the type of things you're gonna need. And Draymond Green was questionable, but ended up sitting out. I'm still waiting for the Draymond Green minutes because I do think he can fix some of the things. He ain't gonna fix everything. There's a lot of things wrong. With he ain't going to fix everything, but he does fix the, the secondary ball handle, the secondary playmaker thing that a lot of the teams that are struggling struggle with. So shout out to them. And when it comes to the Pistons, I mean, the Pistons are going to do that. Um, they're going to lose a lot of games this season. I think every one of their games, they've been competitive and been into it. And I think for a team that's rebuilding, even though they did some crazy ass things this offseason, um, that's all you really want. I'm still so confused on why Christian Wood doesn't play for them anymore. Maybe somebody in the comment section can explain that to me, because why, why do we offer Jeremy Grant? 20 and Mason Plumlee nine but we couldn't just give Christian Wood whatever the hell he wanted because Christian Wood is better than whatever whatever um the Celtics got a win today you know that little revenge game from the Pacers and I was I was very um intrigued in this game because the Pacers had moments in it where they were running away with this seems like but I hate when people tell me on Twitter, hey, can he talk about this but I have no choice if I'm gonna talk about this game I have to talk about the rookie man what is his name? Peyton? Peyton Pritchard? Came in and was super, super important. They needed that type of play. And I don't know, he finished with 10 points. It felt like more than that. His his point, his point points were timely. His his um, assists were timely. And he was the reason to put them over the hump for this win. Um, I was talking, not trash, but I was more concerned about the way Jason Taylor was playing for the first couple games of the season. I think I mentioned how like he's taking these tough-ass shots, and then when he's making them, they're cool, but when he's not, he's it's, it's, it sucks. And, um, and I was talking about how he hasn't been to the free throw line much throughout the first three games this game he got to it a decent amount I'm not gonna add his last like five or six free throws because they were like late game we're gonna foul you know situations it wasn't him getting to the basket nonetheless it's a good bounce back game for them in a game that looked like they were going to lose so um, I still like the way Nate Borkgren ah that's tough um, has this team flowing, and I, I still like what the what the Indiana Pacers are doing. The Bulls got to win. I don't want to spend too much time on the Bulls because, again, 90% of y'all don't care. But um, we, we finally got to win, and the Washington Wizards are way worse than, than we even thought. Um, my biggest concern with them going into this season, even after the Russell Westbrook trade, is they didn't address any of the defensive issues other than they brought in Robin Lopez, who was an OK defender, but he's not going to be out there defending everything. And through the first four games of the season, we see why their defense is so bad. Let's talk about the game. Now, at one point, was at like 50. The Bucks get their revenge on a Jimmy Butler list Miami Heat. Uh, I don't know what else to really what to say about this one. I was out of it three minutes into it. Hopefully you were, too. There's no reason to watch this game. I, the worst thing about this is that the two games that were on TNT, the two games that were on TNT, both ended up being like 40-point L's. And, like, for the people that don't have league pass or don't know any of the outside ways to watch the other games, this was your NBA fix today, and it ended up being ass. You know, I, I hate when stuff like that happens. Um, and Yeah, because the Bucks did what they had to do. I, what do I say? Um, OKC loses another game, one and two, but I am so jealous of what OKC ha are doing right now because each one of their L's have been super competitive. I mean, they got the one game winner, and then Shea Gibbs Alexander had a layup against the Jazz that he missed. And then this one, I mean, I guess it ended up being an 11-point game, but they were in this game the whole time. They have their core group of guys that we would consider like their future and still with all the draft picks, and they're still being competitive. And similar to what I said with the Detroit Pistons as a rebuilding team, you want to have your young guys playing and have competitive basketball. Let's talk about the Suns, 3-1 and one on the season, y'all. 
Chris Paul, man. I'm not giving it all the credit to Chris Paul, obviously, um, but you can see his impact. The way the ball moves on the Phoenix Suns is magnificent. And we saw portions of this in the bubble when it was Ricky Rubio as the starting point guard, but obviously we know that Chris Paul is better than Ricky Rubio, and the ball just swings. I would love to. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with Cameron Payne because I don't know how he went from one of the worst players I have ever seen, and I am not exaggerating, when he was with the Chicago Bulls like two years ago to actually being a good rotational player on a competitive team. I don't know. I would love to see what he did in the offseason and the two offseasons between the time he was really, really bad to the time he's good legitimately Cameron Payne is good at basketball and I never thought that would be a sentence that would come out of my mouth you know what I'm saying so I, I like what they're doing when it comes to the Pelicans I mean I think we talked about this before but like it's so easy to game plan against them I don't trust nobody shooting the ball on their team except for JJ Redick and Brandon Ingram and that seems like what Monty Williams did today was like we're gonna pack the paint Zion's not gonna beat us if Brandon Ingram want to take those shots we'll allow him he went one for five if Lonzo Ball want to take the shot Lonzo Ball has turned himself into a respectable shooter but teams right now are just letting him shoot. He ended up one for seven. There's not a three-point shooter that I trust. Eric Bledsoe can't hit a shot. Obviously, Steven Adams is not going to do that. So um, they had a good game plan defensively, and it worked out. This team ended up putting up what? How many points did they put up? 80, ugh, 86 points on national TV is really bad. It just really is. Um, and that, that was our major criticism going into the season. Like, I don't know what Dave Griffin was doing on some of the things he did. Like, obviously, Steven Adams is a good NBA player, and he holds your defense down on most occasions. But when your star player, one of your star players is a guy like Zion that's like, I'm not saying he's limited to the, the within the first six feet of the rim, but that's where he gets his work done. To have a guy like Steven Adams on the team and extend him, it was just so, it's just so weird to me. It just is. And then obviously with the Eric Bledsoe thing, just the spacing is all off. It's so hard to predict this team, and this is some this is the reason why games like this are going to happen pretty often with this team because if if you don't get a random Eric Bledsoe game, it's going to be hard to get Zion to be super dominant, to have Brandon Ingram to do what he has to do, and have everybody else be. I I I don't like the way they play today. Um, uh, my favorite game of the day ended up being the Kings versus the Nuggets. Now the Nuggets were missing Jamal Murray. Yes. But, man, do I absolutely – I love this Kings team. And I think I've talked about them in the last three episodes because that's just how much I like this team, y'all, from the very top to the bottom. My boy Reese was out there hooping in the Grinches. And shout-out to everybody hooping in the Grinches today. It was a lot of people, um, a, a very special moment um, in Kobe history today. So I think a lot of people had that in mind when they were picking their sneakers for, for today's games. I just like everything about this team, man. Um, I interviewed Reese, and I was saying in that video that, like, this is a team that was going to be competitive. Now, when it got to the draft and Reese fell to there, and obviously I was looking out for him because he's one of the homies, I didn't like the idea of him playing for them just because of the organization, not because of the roster. You know what I'm saying? Because all the bad track record when it comes to the Kings. I mean, we saw some of it this offseason, too, with the Bogdanovich stuff. I didn't like the idea of having one of my guys, one of my friends, go into an organization that has his reputation of just being bad. But right now the team is fun. They're running. De'Aaron Fox has got him. Rashawn Holmes keeps doing that little flip-up layup, and he he ain't missed a single one all season, it feels like. And then Reese hitting big shots. Buddy Hill doing his thing. And then Harrison Barnes, today at least, was playmaking more than I've ever seen Harrison Barnes playmake in my life. Yeah, that's that's all I really have to say. Um, Jokic is still doing things. Michael Porter Jr., I was talking about Jason Tatum as one of those tough shot taker and makers. Michael Porter Jr. is up there, bro. And I know it's a smaller sample size for him compared to some of the other players. But there are plenty of times in this game where I was like, oh, that's a bad, never mind. Good shot, Michael Porter Jr. That's just the way he shoots the ball. And I, I bet it could be frustrating for his teammates. But when he was on like he was today, specifically in the third quarter, then it's hard to guard him. But in the fourth quarter, he kind of went silent. And then that's when the Kings took off and everything. Um, For the games that I did not. I talk about um, the Knicks are two and two. They beat up on Sex Land. I didn't really watch much of this game except for like a few highlights. And I see that Julius Randle turned into who is a Knicks player that got a lot of triple. Uh, Walt Frazier did Walt Frazier get triple doubles back in his day? I literally don't know. He turned into that. Um, and I think I hit every single other game. One of these days, I promise you, Knicks fans, one of these days I'm going to actually sit down and watch a game of yours. It has not happened yet, so I don't have any takeaways from your games usually. I apologize for that. This is probably the game since Julius Randle became the greatest player of all time. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. Oh, in the description, I'm going to leave a link to our Flick chat. If you don't know what it is, the group chat we have, I think we have 6,000 people in there right now that like live react to games together. There's polls, there's money on the line. So I'm going to put that in the description. It's just download it, join the group, and, and let me know what you think about it. All right. I'll see y'all soon. Call the game.